nearly two and a half centuries, American foreign policy has always been place, a place of dispute between the American people and politicians. The debates and positions Americans have taken can be dated back to 1793 with George Washington's proclamation of neutrality. Washington wanted to protect American interests and sovereignty from the entrancement of foreign affairs. About 10, year, 10 years prior to 1793 was the end of the American Revolution, in which Washington spent a long, a long period of time, from 1774 basically, well, 75, and fought for about not eight to nine years a war that was very tiring and brutal. So it must be understood that he cared a lot, so this is where he was coming from. However, due to the rise of political parties and public awareness of government policies and actions, Washington's proclamation was met with criticism and debate. A major part and voice of this debate was Alexander Hamilton's response and opinions in Pacifist Number 1. To understand Hamilton and Washington at this time, you must look at the French Revolution. Americans were sympathetic to the French Revolution taking place in France during the late 1780s and into the 1790s. It was the belief that the French revolutionists were inspired by the American Revolution. Some American opinions were quickly changed, however, with the execution of Louis XVI, the overthrow of the Bourbon monarchy, and the autocratic society. In part, Americans, in particular Washington and Hamilton, viewed the French monarchy and aristocracy as allies to the American Revolution. When Great Britain was then drawn into this conflict, many Americans were convinced that the action had created a life-or-death struggle between classes and ideologies. Many felt the outcome of this Franco-British war was important to the future of America, because if Ameri potentially America got dragged into the, this war between British, the Brit Britain and France, it could drastically change American society or potentially destroy America even though it's been, it was just recently created. In April of 1793, Washington requested his advisors to deliberate on several, several questions regarding the United States' position on, on the war. The overriding question was, should the United States remain neutral? The remaining questions addressed whether the, whether the United States, A, should receive the French ambassador, Chenet, or B, and B, do the either... Do the earlier French treaties apply? Washington's key players in the administration agreed that the United States must remain neutral in the Franco-British War. All parties felt that it would be economically disastrous for the United States to enter into another war. Differences arose between the cabinet members as to whether or not the United States had to maintain the treaties of alliance or, and commerce with France. This was the debate between Jefferson and Hamilton, Democrat, Republican, and a Federalist. Jefferson wished to abide by the stipulations of the treaty. Hamilton then argued that since the French started the European War and King Louis XVI was guillotined by the French revolutionaries, the treaty was null and void. On April 22, 1793, Washington was, with support from his cabinet, issued the Proclamation of Neutrality. The Proclamation of Neutrality starts with, whereas it appears that the state of war exists between Austria, Prussia, Sardinia, Great Britain, and the United Netherlands of the one part, with, and France on the other, and the duty and interest of the United States require that should, with sincerity and good faith, adopt and pursue a conduct friendly and impartial towards the belligerent powers. This is, this is the starting paragraph out of a five-paragraph proclamation that Washington um, issued on April 22nd. 1793. It's important to understand that Washington tried to be quick in this decision. He wanted, Washington wanted to be quick with this. A famous response to the proclamation was written by Washington's Secretary of Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, under the pseudonym Pacifist. Hamilton's response to the political essay named Pacifist Number 1 was published on June 26, 1793, in the Gazette of the United States, which was a Federalist paper. Pacifist number one was to respond to the public outrage over accepting the French ambassador to the Genet and what he was doing, and to defend the president's announcement of the proclamation of neutrality. Many of the critics of the proclamation of neutrality were fans and supporters of French and the French Revolution. The supporters of the French wanted the United States to maintain, its full, maintain fully its stipulated duties to France and believed it was breaking the Constitution during the proclamation being issued during congressional recess, recess and without congressional review. 
Hamilton's goal was to defend and counter and counter the arguments and criticisms that was being presented about the president's decision to stay neutral. It's important to understand that at this time also the Constitution's about six, seven years old and the fact that people are still trying to interpret and put into action the Constitution. And as a result, there are many debates and led to constitutional backing not necessarily being the best thing, but was necessary for an argument at the time period. It's also mentioned that it was put in the Citizen Gazette of the United States, which is important because that was a Federalist newspaper, and many Federalists put their opinions and views in that paper, and it represented those ideas. Hamilton's main argument in Pacifist Number 1 was that the proclamation of neutrality and a policy of neutrality was nece were necessary to the benefits and growth of the United States. The threat of a foreign war would negatively impact the financial and political well-being of the United States. Hamilton's argument addressed the four objections to the proclamation of neutrality. These objections were the proclamation had no authority, the proclamation goes against the authority of the treaties with France, the proclamation goes against what the United States owes to France for helping the United States with the War of Independence, and the proclamation was done was not done at the correct time and not needed. Hamilton, through his statesmanship ability and his federal, federalist perspective, were, was able to dispute these four objections. As a result, Hamilton is able to, was able to accomplish his goal and intent for proving the proclamation of neutrality is needed for the benefit of the United States. Throughout Pacifist Number 1, Hamilton uses and cites the Constitution to prove his arguments. The United States Constitution offered validity to arguments and constitutional backing to the arguments. In Hamilton's case, the inclusion of the Constitution as evidence showed that Hamilton understood the importance of having arguments backed by the Constitution. This was relevant because the Constitution ratification process was still in the minds of the people, especially with the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Papers were essays published in order to promote the ratification of the Constitution through explanations of the Constitution and its importance to the American people. Because the Federalist Papers and an ordinary American had an understanding and, an ed and was educated on the content of the Constitution. As a result, if not backed by the Constitution, an ordinary American could denounce the argument as being invalid and potentially unconstitutional. However, an instance citing an instance of Hamilton's citing of the Constitution is when Hamilton writes the second article of the Constitution of the United States, section first, establishes this general proposition that the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States. Hamilton here is using the Constitution to prove the power of the executive department and the president and its ability to make and put in effect a document like the Proclamation of Neutrality, basically. As a result, Hamilton is able to disprove that, that the president did not ha have the authority to put into effect the proclamation of neutrality. Hamilton then goes on after quoting the Constitution, listing a number of enumerated powers of the president to offer further explanation and proof for his argument of why the president has the power to make a declaration of neutrality. Hamilton earlier even disproves why both the legislative and the judicial branch do not have the pow these powers. The, these help show and prove for Hamilton that the implicit message and meaning of pacifist number one. In writing pacifist number one, Hamilton was, was also trying to gain more power and support for the Federalist Party. It should be noted that Hamilton capitalizes executive power. It is interesting for the fact that Hamilton was technically, at that time, a part of the executive power. He was um, the Secretary of Treasury. So it's interesting that it seems that by capitalizing it, he's trying to promote the idea of the executive department and its power. Also, him disproving that the legislative and judicial power, he's trying to rise the executive branch above those two other branches, even though in the Constitution, Constitution there are checks and balances. Hamilton's implicit message of pacifist number one was to try to prove and gain more power for the Federalist Party as well as support, as well as support. Hamilton presents this implicit idea through his language, style, and even Hamilton's tone throughout the essay. To start, Hamilton uses language similar to the proclamation of neutrality. In the proclamation of neutrality, Washington uses phrases like a conduct friendly and impartial toward the belligerent powers. In Pacifist Number 1, Hamilton uses phrases like the act 
that such that is in the condition of a nation at peace with the belligerent parties. By using similar words and phrases, readers, mostly those who are educated would be reading this, and mostly probably Federalists also, are reminded of P President Washington. As a result, readers will tend to think that the writer side with Washington and because Washington's policy sided with mostly with the Federalists, this means that it potentially could gain more support for the Federalist Party. If people are persuaded by pacifists, um, people might join the Federalist Party and, see, and because of the unanimously voted and liking Washington, vote, liked Washington. Hamilton was a, a, a constant promoter of strong central government and an avid support of the belief of implied powers. These implied powers were used to defend and expand the role and authority of the federal government. Hamilton's defense of the proclamation of neutrality and the advocacy of a strong and central government can be witnessed in his later writings. The government had a right to employ all so the means requisite and fairly applicable to the attainment and of the end such power which were not precluded by restrictions and extension specified in the Constitution or not immortal if, or not contrary to the essential ends of political society. Pacifist number one also implicitly presents the idea of Hamilton's visions of a strong federal government with commerce leading the country's economy. Hamilton utilizes the Constitution to back his argument again throughout the whole. Pacifist number one uses the Constitution to back and support this is his implicit argument on a stronger federal government. The new and growing Federalist Party at the time believed in a federal government that was strong and commerce leading the economy. Since Hamilton, however, at the same time the Democratic Republican Party led with opposite views and the fighting was harsh between the two, creating huge tensions, especially in the executive department. In Pacifist Number 1, Hamilton implicitly mentions the idea of a loose construction of the Constitution. This one's mentioned earlier. For instance, Hamilton writes, It must be necessary to belong to the Executive Department to exercise the function in question when a proper case for the exercise of it occurs. It should be, it should be noted that Hamilton uses similar language to the Necessary Proper Clause in Article 1 of the Constitution, even, even using words even using the words necessary and proper, which promotes a loose construction of the Constitution. The use of similar language provides an, uh, an underlying and underlying that Hamilton with the Hamilton with the loose construction of the Constitution and to, to the executive branch. So it's all, this is also proving that Hamilton wants more power in the executive branch. Hamilton's goal with writing Pacifist number one was to defend the proclamation of neutrality. However, as we've seen at the same time, Hamilton tried to convince the people of the importance of a strong, stronger federal government and the Federalist ideas. Hamilton wrote and published this essay. James Madison, by the request of Thomas Jefferson, wrote an essay debating Pacifist number one, speak, sparking a series of debate debates not now known as the Pacifist Helvetist debate. Um, Madison wrote at Helvetist. The debate, while seemingly explicit about the power of the executive branch, so controversy between the executive and legislative branch and the power of the federal government. So it shows that there were also more tie uh, another loyalty other than U.S. to political powers. Um, it's interesting because Jefferson wrote to um, Madison asking, "Nobody answers him, and his doctrine will therefore be taken for confessed." For God's sake, my dear sir, take up your pen, select the most striking Harris, and cut him to pieces in the face of the public. This quote shows that not only Jefferson hated Hamilton, but also he thought that if he, no one unanswered him, think Hamilton's ideas were word. Should be noted in Hamilton, in Pacifist number one. The first one is the first three paragraphs of pacifist number one. This excerpt starts, As attempts are making very dangerous to the peace and, it is to be feared, not very friendly to the constitution of the U U.S. states, it becomes the duty of those who wish well to both to endeavor to prevent their success. The objections which have been raised against the proclamation of neutrality lately issued by the president have urged in a spirit of acrimony and 
invective, which demonstrate that more was in view than merely a free decision on an important public measure. That was the, the discussion conver covers a design of weakening up the confidence of the people in the author of the preserving industry. This reflection adds the motives connected with the measure itself to recommend endeavors by proper explanations to place high just light. Such explanations at least cannot be satisfactory to those who many not have leisure or opportunity for pursuing themselves an investigation of the subject and who may wish to perceive that policy of the government is not inconsistent with its obligation or its honor. He is starting out the paragraph, so he's obviously mentioning the recent proclamation Washington um, made about neutrality being neutral between in the British Franco war. Also, the French Revolution itself, um, the French Revolution was still, it's in the midst of happening, and the reign of terror was happening, and he's also saying that he feels it's his duty, it's the duty of the federal government, the president, to make this, this declaration, uh, to make, to write this essay, as Hamilton, to make sure people know why this is happening so it can be the proclamation can be successful, as stated in the first paragraph. Hamilton also talks about the idea of industry and where Hamilton writes, The president is the constitutional executor of the laws. Our treaties and the laws of nations from a part of the law of the land. He who is to execu execute the laws must first judge for himself of their meaning in order to the observance of the conduct which the laws of nations combined with our treaties prescribes to this country in reference to the present war in Europe it is necessary for the president to judge for himself whether there was anything in our treaties incompatible with an adherence to neutrality. Having judged that there was not, he had a right and if, in his opinion, the interests of the nation required it, it was his duty as executor of the laws to proclaim the neutrality of the nation, to exhort all persons in observance, and warn them of the penalties which would attend its non-observance. So, Hamilton is basically saying that the president's job to put them into action. So, in this sense, it's the proclamation of neutrality and the war in Europe. So, some but context of this paragraph and excerpt is Hamilton's, Ham, Hamilton uses the war in Europe, so the Franco-British War. He also is referencing the, the idea of French treaties, so Treaty of Paris, the treaties before that that uh, have started the alliance with France in the first place, bef during the, Amer the beginnings of the American Revolution, when France first joined. The you know, he is talking about his belief and interpretation of the Constitution, Hamilton, and Hamilton is Hamilton believes the president is the constitutional executor of the laws, which is is true, and then he furthers and elaborates that Hamilton believes the president is the executor of the law, but the way it is in context, it's interesting to the fact that he views and puts the the executive branch and the president higher than the legislative or the judicial branch meaning the executive is higher despite checks and balances which would say all are equal in Hamilton's view he's basically saying the president is the highest has the most authority has the most control over the government over the nation it also is interesting that Hamilton is trying to also present the idea that he's trying to present his idea of a elast, uh, the elastic clause, the necessary and proper clause, same thing, but he, of a loose, basically a loose construction of the Constitution where he, he's basically saying, well, it doesn't necessarily say this, but 
in order to do this, he must do this. In order to fulfill this um, enumerated power or responsibility, he must do this. So in order for Washington to protect the nation, in order for him to execute the laws, he must enact this proclamation of neutrality for the safety of America. And Hamilton is putting it in pacifist number one. In addition, he, while also supporting a strong executive, he's also trying to support a strong federal, which is showing um, a strong, that he would prefer a strong federal government. And the So, basically, this is summing up pacifist number one, saying the president has all power, but it's also summarizing federalist belief. I would like to thank you for your time for watching this video. This for Mr. O'Reilly's period two AP United States History one class for um, analyzing and um, determining the context and subtext of Alexander Hamilton's pacifist number one. To observe and learn more about Alexander Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, and the Federalist Party.